from Paris, France. You're watching Cardio Source video news coverage of ESC 2011. Hello, I'm Tony DeMari, the editor of Jack, here at the European Society of Cardiology meetings, and with me is Chris Cannon, and we're talking about the highlights of today's late-breaking clinical trials. And I guess, Chris, uh, actually a study presented late yesterday, but one that really resonated was uh, the RELY trial on the question of triple antithrombotic therapy. It's very true. This is a vexing problem we face all the time of patients who need aspirin and clopidogrel for a stent, but who are also in atrial fibrillation. Current guidelines say to use warfarin at a lowish INR of 2 to 2.5. And so out of the new anticoagulant trials, this was a key subgroup that was presented and found that, uh, as was seen in the overall trial, with the 110 milligram dose, major bleeding and intracranial hemorrhage were lower with dabigatran 110 versus warfarin, and the bleeding was equal, uh, you know, with warfarin or 150. Um, and so, uh, if you needed triple therapy, you had a 60 percent higher risk of bleeding, which we all know. And a potential solution is this 110 milligram dabigatran dose. Ironic that it's not available in the United States. The FDA's withheld that. So that's a point of contention that I think many of us feel that it was felt overall that the 110 has better stroke prevention, but it also has higher bleeding than the 110. But here's this high risk subgroup for bleeding where we would actually like a, a regimen that would have a lower bleeding risk. So this hopefully will be a point of discussion with FDA and, you know, Canada has it, all of Europe has the 110 dose and maybe we should too in the United States. Yeah, there are so many patients now who require uh, antithrombotic therapy, warfarin uh, for atrial fib and also aspirin clopidogrel for stents so many patients that if, in fact, we could minimize bleeding risk with using dabigatran at the lower 110 dose, uh, that would seem to be a really neat way to go. Yes. Now, there are a couple of ICD trials. The Evatel trial got a lot of attention, and, and that dealt with the question of whether or not you could adequately remote monitor patients who received ICD therapy rather than bringing in the patients every three to six months for routine medical follow-up. And uh, there were matched groups. It was a randomized trial conducted here in, in France. And in fact, at the end of the trial, what they found was that the remote monitoring by intention to treat was, was non-inferior to bringing patients in, into the office. Uh, however, there was a high crossover group. In, the, in about 50 patients, the technology didn't work so that if you looked at what uh, assignment the patients actually received, then it wasn't quite non-inferior. But nevertheless, the message I took away is remote monitoring is pretty reasonable for ICD therapy. Yeah, and I think, you know, there was a, uh, a paper in Jack showing that you can pick up early after events, you know, AFib in these patients or other arrhythmias. And so it gives you an early read on something's up with a patient. So hopefully that can be helpful. Yeah, and, and in fact, that was the second study, the so-called E-Cost study. And the E-Cost study looked at whether or not uh, remote monitoring could be effective in reducing complications from ICDs, uh, particularly inappropriate uh, shocks or uh, high-charge shocks. And uh, the monitoring here was daily monitoring, daily remote monitoring, of course. And uh, what was demonstrated was that, in fact, the patients had less inappropriate shocks, probably for some of the reasons you talked about. So the question, of course, always comes down to money. Is there reimbursement for, for this remote monitoring, and, and can it save you money? 
A very tough problem, but it looks like the technology is there and hopefully it can find the right balance of using this technology to pick up arrhythmias. Sure, sure. And the RESET trial, of course, was a quick trial showing non-inferiority between Everolimus and Sirolimus. Uh, a little bit uh, inconsequential now that Sirolimus uh, stents have been withdrawn. Uh, overall, I think we see a lot of the second-generation drug-eluting stents really performing reasonably well, and they're finding all their place. I think uh, the Everolimus, obviously, is the, uh, the most commonly used one these days. So. Yeah. Well, other trials to talk uh, about uh, for biventricular pacing and ivabradine. We'll be right back.